The following is a text exchange which occurred between brothers on June 8, 2021. 10.23 a.m. Today, for no particular reason, I started to wonder how deep into Earth humans have drilled. The answer had somewhat of a space race feel to it, although the Americans seemed to have dropped out early, leaving the Germans to race the Soviets. The Soviets won. And did they find anything exciting? Hydrogen, plankton fossils, the usual stuff. The Germans drilled in Bavaria. The Russians drilled on land near the border with Norway. The Americans drilled in the Pacific Ocean. Oh, they started deeper. Good thinking. That's capitalism for you. The BBC says the advantage of drilling through the ocean floor is that the Earth's crust is thinner there. The disadvantage is that the thinnest areas of the crust is usually where the ocean is at its deepest. Well, right. That makes sense. 10.30 Straight from the heartland, this is Things I Text My Brother. Hey folks, and welcome back to another episode of Things I Text My Brother, a series of conversations which have taken place between the brothers from Yard on subjects spanning the neighborhood and the globe, which will hopefully leave you smarter, kinder, and better looking. Today we're going to jump off from that dramatic reading that you just heard and discuss the topics therein. Maybe we'll talk about Ivan Drago. Maybe we'll talk about the Empire State Building, or Brighton and Hove Albion FC. Maybe we'll talk about subterranean Ferraris, Giants Coffin, or the Shrieking of the Dam. But we haven't plotted an exact course because we want you to join us on that journey. That's how it works on Things I Text My Brother. I'm Jeff. This is Brad. Let's talk about our texts. But before we dig deep into that subterranean text exchange from moments ago, we need to take a look back because it's always important to make time to cleanse ourselves of our past sins and to continue our boundless quests for self-improvement through worthless information. Thus it's time for ablutions and edification. All right, Brother Brad, you're the one who screwed up recently. What do you have for an ablution? Well, I'm fairly certain that I had an ablution the last time we talked. Typical. Yeah. In episode 19, when we talked about candy, you mentioned a type of fabric called lame. Lame. Yes. I said that I didn't remember it, what it was, and you had to remind me that it was fabric. And I should have known it was fabric, I said, because I would sell it in my factory called Spawn of Satin. Yes. I did not mean factory. I meant store. I'm not going to build a Spawn of Satin factory, but a Spawn of Satin store to sell my fabrics and clothes. It would be interesting to build a factory that could spawn satin, satin. especially yeah. when so many people are convinced that the word satin means Satan, because you would probably have protesters outside your factory saying, why are you building Satan? It is one of my dreams to do something <laughs> that is not, in fact, anti-religion that makes people think it is. And I get protesters. It would be exciting to me because I'd be mm. like, what are you talking about? It's satin, bro. And I could be all innocent. It would be great. And you would go, that's lame. Or they would say, that's lame. And you would say, no, that's lame. Yes. I got it. I saw where you were going. Yes. So I have cleansed myself. Good ablution. Good ablution. Well, I have a little bit of edification going back to our last episode, which was episode 20, Swan Boats and the Real Bonapartes of New Jersey. Brad, have you heard of a little thing called the Jersey Devil? I know of the New Jersey Devils in hockey. Do you know of the creature, the, I don't know, the, the Chupacabra of southern New Jersey? Which no. is the title I'm giving it. It's just a, a mythical creature, or is it mythical? Who knows? But you don't know what the Jersey Devil actually is? I don't. I know what the Tasmanian Devil is, but I don't ah. know what the Jersey Devil is. So the Jersey Devil, just real quickly... Uh, it all stems back to a story saying that this woman, uh, Mother Leeds, back in 1735, a family lived in southern Jersey near Philadelphia, so that area is where this uh, Jersey Devil allegedly occurs. She had 12 children already. When she found out she was pregnant with the 13th one, she was cursing it. She didn't want another kid, and she said, this child's going to come out and be the devil. And then apparently she gave birth to this child. Some accounts say that he came out as a normal child, but then transformed immediately into this entity with hooves and either a horse head or a goat head, had bird legs and these crazy big bat wings, claws, and um, apparently this creature 
just kind of whooped up on everybody in Mother Leeds' house and then flew up the chimney or out of the house. And every now and then, people in southern Jersey and the Philadelphia area claim to see the Jersey Devil. But none of this has to do with our episode about Joseph Bonaparte until one afternoon, the ex-king of Spain, Joseph Bonaparte, was hunting alone in the woods near his New Jersey home. And this story comes from AmericanFolklore.net, retold by somebody named S.E. Schlosser. So he says, former King Joseph is out hunting. He sees some strange tracks on the ground that look like a two-footed donkey. And Bonaparte noticed that one foot was slightly larger than the other. The tracks ended abruptly as if a creature had flown away. But how could a hoofed creature fly away, you ask? Well, he stared at the tracks for a moment, trying to figure out what the strange animal might be. At that moment, he heard a strange hissing noise. Turning, he found himself face to face with a large winged creature with a horse-like head and bird-like legs. Astonished and frightened, he froze and stared at the beast, forgetting that he was carrying a rifle. For a moment, neither of them moved. Then the creature hissed at him, beat his wings, and flew away. When Bonaparte reported the incident to a friend later that day, he was told that he had just seen the Jersey Devil, who had haunted the Pine Barrens and then that area ever since that stormy night in 1735 where Mother Leeds gave birth to that hideous creature. And Bonaparte was impressed by the story of the Jersey Devil and therefore kept lookout for the fabulous creature whenever he went hunting. Alas, by the time he moved over to England and eventually to Italy, he had never seen it again. But he never forgot the Jersey Devil. So less of a dingo got my baby thing uh, and more of a the dingo is my baby. The dingo is my baby. That's your edification. A former king of Naples and Spain who was actually French came to New Jersey and saw a creature with hooves, bat wings, goat head, whatever. I do encourage our listeners to go to the internet search engine of their choice and to look up images of the Jersey Devil. You will find a wide variety. And they are definitely worth seeing. If he had uh, taken the job as the president of Mexico when people tried to offer it to him, he would have potentially seen the Chupacabras instead. And maybe he could have seen both. Yes, and then he could have had a battle royale between the Chupacabra and the Jersey Devil. So Brad, let me ask you a question. Yes. If there were a battle royale between the Chupacabra, which you are well-versed in, yes. and the Jersey Devil, which you're just learning the dimensions and the characteristics of, who would win? Well, I believe that the Jersey Devil is not going to win because the Chupacabras is just scarier. Well, folks, we're cleansed. You're edified. It's time to move on. All right, friends, with our ablutions and edification out of the way, now it's time to dig deep into that topic that we are talking about. What is the deepest point that we've ever bored into the Earth's surface? So, Brad, what are we going to talk about first today? I like that that was part of the Cold War at least for a little while, between yeah. Russia and the United States before the United States dropped out. I mean, the space race was exciting. The Americans TV show, interesting. Rocky versus Ivan Drago, you know, fun. Nuclear war and mutually assured destruction, not as much fun. <laughs> yeah, it is. It, I agree with you that it's very interesting that this had a very space race feel to it. It's taking place at very much the same time. The Kola Superdeep Borehole that the, that the Soviets dug, that was in 1970, and the Americans were working on a project called Project Mohol before that. So it's, it's taking place at the same time as the space race, and really, what we could discover under the Earth could be just as valuable, potentially, as you know, rocks we're bringing back from the moon or whatever the case may be. Here are the stats of it. They started this hole, the, the Soviets started it on the 24th of May in 1970. They reached the deepest point in 1989, although the site stayed open after that, uh, they kept digging till 1992, closed it in 1995. The main hole that they dug went down 40,230 feet, which is a distance of about 7.6 miles or 12.2 kilometers. That's about one third of the way through the Earth's crust to the mantle, which everybody is trying to get to the mantle. But they, the deepest hole only made it about a third of the way through the Earth's crust. Now, I want to keep this episode from being a total bore. Uh, oh, I see what you did there. Oh, uh, too late. I think it's too late. So then the Russians, they were digging down in, in other spur lines, but their deepest hole went down 
that's 12.2 kilometers or 7.619 miles. Once they get down there, it's the torque of the drill and the, the temperatures because they weren't going completely vertical. So there's torque on the drill, temperatures of about 356 degrees Fahrenheit or 180 Celsius just cause constant breakdowns. But the answer to the question is that is the deepest hole we've ever made it into the earth. Are you impressed? You know, it sounds impressive when you say 40,200 feet. And then when you say 7.6 miles and you only made it a third of the way through the crust, which there's the crust, then the upper mantle, the lower mantle, the outer core and the inner core. So it's they didn't even make it through the first of the five layers of the onion that is the earth. Yeah, it's the the crust is about 25 miles deep. And yeah, they didn't make it all that far through it. If this is an egg, we didn't really even make it through the shell. I say we in the universal sense, because very rarely will you hear an American calling himself we when talking about the 1970s Soviet Union. It doesn't seem all that impressive. Nah. Well, the American project, if there was one American project kind of encapsulated within this uh, subterranean space race, you'd have to say it was a project called Project Mohol. And that was, again, their effort was explicitly to try and make it down to the mantle. The difference being that the Americans decided to do that under the Pacific Ocean. So hopefully they'd cut out some of the middlemen and wouldn't have to go as far. It was conceived very much as a complement to the space race and was considered potentially just as valuable by the group that planned it. Do you know their name? No, but they're not good at naming things because the mole hole is not nearly as exciting as the borehole of the, the Russians. So I'm going to assume it's something lame like the Hole Diggers Association of the United States of America. Yeah, not not that. So let's make a distinction. Their whole, it wasn't called the mole hole. It was the mo hole, which has something to do with the mantle. I read the description, but yeah, that's kind of boring. But the group that came up with... Wait, wait, it's not even mole? No, it's Mo. M O E? I think just M O. Well, that that's even more lame. There is a scientific reason for that. If I was smart or did better research, I would be able to tell you that now. But let's not get lost in what's not important because what's important is that the group of scientists who conceived this plan was called the American Miscellaneous Society. Well, that that is actually a better name than I expected. That's basically the scientific society most akin to our mission as the hosts of the, what is the name of our podcast, Brad? Things I Text My Brother. Yes. So this is the scientific society that's closest to our vision, which is basically anything could be included in the American Miscellaneous Society. But they actually chose this group, which was variously described as a drinking club or a scientific society or, or a few things in between. They decided to go off of Guadalupe, Mexico. They're talking about it in the late 1950s. 1961, they begin digging. They make it 601 feet under the ocean floor. So they go down through the water, but they actually dig 600 feet compared to the 40,230 feet of digging that the Russians do. They're in 11,700 feet of water. So they end up a total of, uh, what, 12,000 something feet below the water surface, unlike the Russians who end up 40,000 feet. So it's safe to say that they were not a success. It was a failure in total depth. The one thing they did do is they helped to invent some of the technologies needed for deep sea drilling, which these days, of course, underwater wells, the extraction of oil and gas is a big deal. Back then it wasn't being done. So they kind of made that possible. But Totally insane costs just spiraling out of control. And actually, this project, which the digging, like I said, began in 61, it was defunded by 1966. Two years before Neil Armstrong is actually walking on the moon, this subterranean space race effort of the United States is defunded and suspended. I suppose that's why we never heard of it. Yeah. Because we don't like to be losers. <laughs> I assume they also invented the spring break vacation in uh, Cancun while they were down there as well. Sure. With a name like the Miscellaneous Society, they probably were doing a lot of drinking. And that's something to be proud of, because what's more American than college students being idiots in a foreign country? It does seem right. Yeah. It's worth mentioning the one other member of this triumvirate of digging that was done during the Cold War and really inspired by it. You have the Germans popping in in the late 1980s. 1987, they start digging a super deep borehole, the KTB super deep borehole in northern Bavaria. They reached only 29,859 feet, way more than the miscellaneous society of Americans, but well short of the 40,000 some feet that the Soviets had made. 
Now, they had the advantage of time. They don't start till 1987, so they learn some of the mistakes. They realize they need to go more vertically to make sure that they're not putting torque on their drills. Problem is they're digging not in the Arctic Circle. They're digging in a, in a much warmer place, and they're encountering temperatures of 500 degrees Fahrenheit or 260 Celsius by the time they get down to their ultimate level. And then the world changes with the fall of communism and, and the uh, reinventing of Germany, they couldn't really justify putting more money into this project. So by 1995, it shut down. Unlike the other projects, though, the um, well, the the Soviet project, you can see a picture of this rusted metal cap that goes over this little tiny hole in the ground. Its surface hole is very small. It's just bolted shut in the middle of nowhere. There was a building over the Soviet site. It's it's fallen apart, very much in disrepair. It looks like something that is very much a remnant of the Cold War that's been forgotten, which is exactly what it is, I guess, except for the totally forgotten part. The German site, though, you can actually go to the borehole area. Scientific experiments are done there, and the drilling rig is still on site. It's become a tourist attraction. Would you like to visit the German borehole, Brad? I would not. Why? I have no interest in deep holes in the earth because I am scared of heights and looking in would just make me scared. That answered our our question. My original question of how deep we've dug in the earth has been answered. It's the Russians. It's 12.2 kilometers or 7.6 miles. It's finishing in 1989, really. All right. So that's how deep it was. What did they find when they went down there? I know you said a little bit in there. Was it like Jules Verne and the journey to the center of the earth? Did they come across a giant underground ocean and mushrooms, dinosaurs fighting each other, troglodytes? Was it exciting? I assume it was all that. I mean, at at the very least, they could have hoped to do what uh, I found some boys in California who were digging in their backyard of a house they just moved into in 1978. And they found a stolen Ferrari buried underground. But to my knowledge, the Soviets, not only did they not find a stolen Ferrari, I don't know of them finding any of the other things that you mentioned. What did they find? I don't I don't know. That's why I was asking you. No, I didn't look any further into it. I did start researching other cool things that have been found underground, but I didn't find anything with that. You mentioned the kids digging down and finding the Ferrari. Yep. And I, I wanted to ask you, did you ever try to dig a, a deep hole in the ground? I feel like everybody who has a little bit of space probably did at some point Yeah. try to dig deep down. Well, I remember in our childhood home, there we had a, a double lot, and on the open lot had previously been a greenhouse before our parents owned it. Right. So some of these cement foundations of, I think, <laughs> some of the corners and things were still in the ground. Yes. The deepest hole I remember digging in our native home was digging up some of those concrete foundations so that childhood sandlot football games didn't have to end with more injuries of our head hitting concrete and the jagged metal pieces that came out of them. So that was probably the deepest hole from childhood. I doubt I dug deeper as an adult. I've dug up a few stumps, but I don't think I made it too far. I have a memory. I don't know if it's if it's true or not. I have a memory of digging in the garden and burying all the apples that fell out of the tree because Mm. the apples collected bees and Yeah, they were everywhere. It wasn't great to have all those bees around. I don't know if I was told to do this or Cousin Ben and I just got tired of being attacked by bees. (laughs) So we moved all the apples into a hole in the garden. And I remember digging as deep as we could. And we thought we had dug this massive hole. And it was probably like six feet deep. (laughs) Six feet is good. We were probably like eight. But it was pretty deep for us. uh, Deep enough that we probably had to help each other in and out. So I wondered... You know, how how deep anyone had ever dug by hand Ooh. after I had been thinking about that, right? Me too. What'd you find? So I found out that there's a place in Brighton, England, on the southeast coast of England at Newfield Hospital. It's called Wooding Dean Well. Wooding Dean Water Well, about two and a half miles from the stadium of Brighton and Hove Albion FC. The Seagulls. The Seagulls. What'd you find out about the Wooding Dean Water Well? Well, I found out that it was 1,285 feet deep, so 1,285 feet deep. So that's about the same height as the Empire State Building. Oh, yes. That's a good, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And do you know what sound it would make if you drop something down into the well? I feel like maybe nothing. It would sound like large marge falling from the top of the Empire State Building in a dump truck. (laughs) Tell them large marge sent you. Yeah. Anyway. So that was what? It was six feet wide at the top and then got four feet wide as they went down. But people went down in that four foot wide hole 
1,285 feet deep. It's insane. Digging out and passing dirt up. Yeah. And bricks down. And I actually read about this too. In fact, the best site for those who want to dig deeper in the story, the best site that I found about it was mybrightonandhove.org.uk. And they described those working conditions. So yeah, four feet circle down at the bottom. It's incredibly hot down there. So they said a lot of the diggers were digging naked down there. The sand hogs at Brooklyn Bridge did the same. Yeah, so yeah. digging naked in a four-foot hole takes forever to get down there. You're loading up buckets so they can get winched up. And then my favorite part of it was, well, the goal of this actually was to reach water for this workhouse, to provide water for a new workhouse for paupers. And there's going to be an industrial school built on the site for juveniles to save misplaced youth <laughs> from the bane of pauperism. I saw that as well. Yeah. And so that's what this project is for. But it means the goal is to get water. Which means at some point, you have to expect you're going to be at the bottom of this hole and then water's going to show up. And this can become kind of a scary scenario, especially when you're 1,280 feet deep in the earth. And as it turns out, in this case, there was a guy. He's digging at the bottom. And he suddenly feels that the ground, it wasn't so much a trickle, which I've heard other digging stories that kind of begin with a trickle water. What he said he noticed was that the entire ground base beneath him started rising up like a piston, <laughs> just going up. So the ground is literally coming to life. And at that point, he hustled up the ladder and it's a long way to go. And, and everybody gets out of there and that piston just keeps rising. The hole fills up with water and eventually all their gear ends up being thrust up to the top in this flood of water. And, and then I guess the uh, misplaced youth could be saved from pauperism. It took the workers 45 minutes to get out of the hole. So they had these brick walls that they built, but they had mm -hmm. just left like footholds in between the bricks. So not only was he scrambling out with water getting ready to shoot out below him, he was trying to find these toe holes oh, in the geez. dark in a brick wall. And he made it out in 45 minutes. And I'm like, that's pretty impressive. I wonder how long it would take you to climb the Empire State Building because it's same height, but, you know, has stairs and things. I have an answer to this. Do you have an answer? What's your answer? Well, they in the past, they've had a race every year. And yes. as, as I recall, the winners of the race are usually somewhere like 10 and a half minutes. Right. The record is 9 minutes and 37 seconds for running yeah. up the stairs. And those are the winners. If you walk up, it takes you about 42 to 47 wow. minutes. Which, by the way, coincidentally, if you were to dig a hole all the way through the earth from one side to the other, it would take, they think, 42 minutes to fall through the hole from one side to the other. Whoa. That would be, there'd be a lot of wind burn. There'd be a lot of heat burn. I would think so. I wonder how many different ways, if the first death didn't kill you, how many different ways would you die while falling entirely through the earth in 42 minutes? I bet there would be a number of different elements which could kill you individually. But it probably wouldn't include being swallowed by a whale. Well, even being swallowed by a whale rarely includes being swallowed by a whale. So I guess that's nothing new. Exactly. It took them four years of around-the-clock digging to dig that by hand. Yeah, finishing in 1862. So this is what they were up to basically during the beginning of the Civil War, that, that type of era. Yeah. Pretty impressive. It's just covered up sitting there, what, next to a hospital these days? Yeah, it was, there was a school there for a while, and it was hidden in some metal shed, and kids were afraid to go there because there were rumors that there was like a nun at the bottom who was thrown in and all kinds of stuff. Well... The students at the uh, Wooden Dean water well were worried about what was at the bottom. At the German KTB Superdeep borehole, there was actually a Dutch artist named uh, Lotte Givan, something along those lines. She actually had the chance to send a microphone with a thermal shield down into that German borehole. And she sent it way down to the bottom. And when it got there, they heard a deep rumbling that the scientists couldn't explain. And I liked her quote. This Dutch artist, uh, Lottie, said, that she felt very small. It was the first time in my life that this big ball that we live on came to life, and it sounds haunting. Others heard the recording and said that it sounded like the earth breathing, or it sounded like hell, which that actually happened. The microphone going down to the bottom, we have those recordings. But this led me into another story. Did you happen to hear anything about, it was most commonly referred to as the well to hell? No, I know the run through hell, Michigan. Ben had a t-shirt from there. <laughs> well, this story is kind of a deep dive, or in this case, a, a deep dig. It dates back to the end of the Cold War, that era, in the early 1990s. Most people 
in the United States at least, first became aware of it during a segment produced by the Trinity Broadcasting Network. It gets pretty confusing, but long story short, there had been this guy from Finland. He came over to the United States. He had seen some kind of story about a hole being dug in, I guess it would be the Soviet Union at that time. The Trinity Broadcasting Network said that they first were tipped off on this by a Finnish newspaper. And the Trinity Broadcasting Network story said, A geological group drilled a hole about 14.4 kilometers deep in the crust of the Earth. Now, we know the deepest hole that's ever been dug is 12.2 kilometers, so keep that in mind. That's right. So this is a lie. So 14.4 kilometers deep in the crust of the Earth, saying that they heard human screams. Screams have been heard from the condemned souls from the Earth's deepest hole. Terrified scientists are afraid that they've let loose the evil powers of hell up to the Earth's surface. Dr. Azakov, the manager of the project in remote Siberia, said, The information we're gathering is so surprising, we're sincerely afraid of what we might find down there. And the story then went on to say that the temperatures were somewhere near 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, which at the German borehole, we had gotten to something like 500 degrees Fahrenheit, 356 Fahrenheit in the Russian hole. So hot, but not around 2,000 degrees, like this alleged Dr. Ozakoff was saying. And they actually talked about their microphones, which they had sent down there first, just hearing a high-pitched noise. But after making adjustments to the microphones, the story goes on to say, we could hardly believe our own ears. We heard a human voice screaming in pain. Even though one voice was discernible, we could hear thousands, perhaps millions in the background, of suffering souls screaming. After this ghastly discovery, about half of the scientists quit in fear. Hopefully, that which is down there will stay down there, said Dr. Azikoff. What do you think so far, Brad? I think so far that the microphone would have melted if it was 2,000 degrees, so I don't believe they could have gotten a microphone down there, quite frankly. So we have this story, it's the Shrieking of the Damned, which is not anything that I heard anybody else calling it, but that's essentially what we have. Trinity Broadcasting Network has put this forward eventually on a site called trutherfiction.com, which I saw very similar versions of this story on several different websites, mostly related to debunking things, but it seemed like this guy named Rich Bueller, who uh, published an article called Drilling to Hell Facts on this truth or fiction website, if anybody wants to to go look it up, there's more to this story. It gets very complex because Rich Bueller and his, his, I guess he has a team, started doing research like, where did this actually come from? And it leads them through a number of different things. The Trinity Broadcasting Network says that they heard about it from this Finnish article. These people who wrote the Finnish article said that they were given this story by a Texas evangelist who said that he heard about it from this other respected journal in Finland, which was not actually a respected scientific journal as the network claimed. It was some other kind of religious network. There was a Finnish man named, I don't know how it's pronounced, Age Rendelin. And he confirmed all this because he first heard the story in the U.S. He thought it was ridiculous. He went home and studied the Finnish roots of it. And then he actually was calling up people and embellishing the story. So he sent a letter to the Trinity Broadcasting Network encouraging them to tell the story again and not to let the skeptics interfere with their telling. He included a copy of a local newspaper, a translation which he claimed was an article from Norway's largest and reputable newspaper, and more information about the drilling. He also told a preacher in the United States the true facts. He told them all of this going on, and he listed that preacher as a reference. And if anybody had called him to research and and to do some fact-checking, the preacher was going to tell him the truth behind this hoax and that it had been embellished by this Finnish guy. The article, though, that the guy from Finland, Rendelin, had sent them was not actually an article about drilling or the shrieking of the damned or anything. The article he had sent was an article from his local community newspaper about a building inspector. So before running this story, the Trinity Broadcasting Network had two tools which they could have fact-checked. They could have had somebody translate this article and would have realized it was about a local building inspector, or they could have called up this local preacher that was prepared to tell him. He never got the call. They ran the story. Eventually, the guy who did the fact-checking for this website He had called up this uh, Rendelin guy and said, are you the one who gave this information to the Christian television network about scientists drilling into hell? Yes, he said without hesitation. Do you have any way of knowing whether it's true? Yes, I do, he replied. None of it is true. I fabricated every word of it. 
It's a great urban legend. There were actually several more publications from Finland involved in the chain that I didn't bother going into because it was all too confusing anyway. But I, I love that the well to hell, as it's called, and uh, the souls that were screaming out of it all came from Finland and one school teacher that was having a good time and punking people with articles about a local building inspector. When was this? Uh, the story started emerging in the early 1990s. So. Oh, so before Google Translate. I can give them a pass a little bit on the translation piece because it wasn't as easy as just copying and pasting text into a translator. No, but I presume in the early 1990s, somebody other than this school teacher and people in Finland would have been able to speak Finnish. I, I suppose so. And I should definitely point out that even though the Trinity Broadcasting Network broadcasted this and put it in their newsletter, there were various Christian organizations who followed that up by doing some research and uncovering it themselves. So it was run with for a little while, but there was some responsible effort uh, undertaken shortly thereafter. Did the Trinity News Group run a news story with an ablution for themselves? <laughs> I don't know if they did or not. I did see something one of their on-air people talked about. Well, if it was some kind of hoax or whatever, then the joke is on whoever committed it. Because I, I think she said something like, I know 2,000 people who have come to God because of this story. Well, yeah, I guess uh, but any any means necessary, I suppose. Hey. And as we talked about in, in episode number four about Denville Curry and the preacher with no vocal cords, if something brings you to a religion that then makes your life better and you use it in a positive way, then I'm all for the 14 kilometer borehole with the screaming souls of the netherworld. Do you remember going to Castalia and the blue hole? I remember the blue hole existing. I don't remember anything about what it was. Well, other than Castalia being the site of my greatest ever artistic triumph, hmm. Shout out to my image of water droplets falling out of a faucet and then running a race, which I named Running Water. Um, <laughs> Zing! I won an honorable mention for that at the art event in Castalia. But the Blue Hole is this pond that they used to tell us was bottomless. It turns out it's only 50 feet deep. <laughs> That's not bottomless and, and not really that all that scary, although I probably will never go 50 feet underwater anyway. I also was remembering Mammoth Cave. So right after this rock fall they call Giant's Coffin, you get to Bottomless Pit. I remember I had nightmares after we went to Mammoth Cave about falling forever in a hole because of stupid Bottomless Pit. And maybe that's where my fear of heights come from. Maybe mm -hmm. I already had it. I don't know. But it was super scary. I had dreams of falling. I had dreams of you falling in it. And Mom and Dad and Angie falling in it. It was super scary. It's only 105 feet deep. <laughs> yeah, obviously enough to kill you. But again, not bottomless. Well, it's, it's more impressive than the blue hole. Right, more impressive than the blue hole, but more deadly than the blue hole. Because I, I suppose if I fell into a 50-foot pond, I probably wouldn't die. Um, but I probably would die if I fell 105 feet. There's a part of that story that I found really touching, though. You said that after seeing this, you were afraid that you would die, which that's not the touching part. But you were afraid that I would die? I, I was. I was afraid you would die. I also had many... I'm touched by that, Brad, because we, we had many battles during our youth. Yeah. Well, Fat Man's Misery and Tall Man's Agony at Mammoth Cave also scared me as a child. I went back as an adult with my kids. Didn't scare me any less because I was a bit fatter and taller than I was as a child going through those things and had an even tighter squeeze. That was pretty much a living nightmare for me to go into Mammoth Cave. I don't like being in closed places. I don't like heights, so going across the, the bottomless pit, not awesome. It wasn't great for me. Yeah, well, even though none of the bottomless pits that we explored during our youth were that impressive, there was one person who was always impressive during our childhood. He's not a troglodyte, he doesn't have bat wings, but he is our father art, and we're going to ask him some questions. Which country do you think could dig the deepest hole in the earth today? Well, probably China, although I don't know where they would, uh, what would be at the bottom of their hole since China is at the bottom of our holes. Would your answer be the same if the Soviets were still in charge? No, I, I, I don't want to talk about the Soviets. They're, they're too scary to me. What about Ivan Drago? Oh, I, I like Ivan Drago. I like his look. 
As an established owner of a shovel, what would you estimate to be the deepest hole you have ever dug? If possible, name why you dug the hole. Well, the, the several times I, I dug uh, holes to bury bodies in, that, that would be the deepest um, and the explanation for why I dug, dug the hole. I assume those are animal bodies. Well, yeah, cats mostly, but... Uh, uh, why do you hate cats? I don't hate cats, but they some of, sometimes they they just die naturally. We, the, why did you put naturally in air quotes? I, I did not. I didn't kill them. But my my favorite was the cat we buried near the uh, water spigot because he loved drinking out of uh, he he loved dripping water so much. Do you prefer digital underground or analog underground? Not sure I understand the difference, but uh, I like analog everything better. They have people who can run up to the top of the Empire State Building up the stairs in less than ten minutes. How long do you think it would take you to climb to the top of the Empire State Building stairs? Uh, probably the rest of my life. But uh, I, I did have a boss who who was uh, who covered the race up the Empire State Building once, and he was the least athletic person I've ever met in my life. I thought that was kind of appropriate. Did he climb the stairs? No. I think he probably paid to have somebody do it for him. Well, folks, now that we've heard from Father Art, it means that our time together is coming to an end for this episode. We've said just about everything we're prepared to say about bottomless blue holes, the Jersey Devil, Brad's supreme artistic talents, misplaced youth and pauperism, and school teachers from Finland convincing the Trinity Broadcasting Network that articles about Finnish building sites are actually about the souls of the damned shrieking in the deepest borehole mankind has ever created. But fear not, just as soon as we can dig back into the archives and find another gem of a text exchange, there will be another episode coming your way. In the meantime, you can head over to our Instagram page at Things I Text My Brother Podcast to drop us a note about what you liked, what you didn't like, or to tell us about something that we got totally wrong. You might even have time to go tell a friend, an enemy, and a total stranger to give us a listen as well. If you manage to do any of that, the fraternity of your yards will be forever grateful. But most importantly, thanks for listening, and we'll talk to you next time. Woo! I think we did we did well there. Well, we did well there. I see what you did. I didn't even know that I was doing it. You're very punny today. That is true. Yes. Je ne suis pas un animal. Je suis un homme. Je m'appelle le tic. Je m'appelle le tic. All right. We're going to stop recording. Bye-bye. Okay, bye.